So today I'm gonna to make an argument about our moral obligations to donate our kidneys. Now, I don't really expect everyone to believe this argument, to buy the conclusion. That's why I'm wearing this funny jacket. I'm trying to signal that like, you know, maybe this is an obscure, weird argument. There's something maybe wrong with it. But you know, nonetheless, I think it's a good argument and it's something that we should be considering. So first, let's talk about some numbers. We should talk about the amount of people in need of dialysis or a kidney transplant and the cost. So first, there's about 100,000 people on the national kidney wait list. And of the over 40,000 transplants in 2021, about half of them, about 22,000, were kidney transplants. And that's great, that's awesome, but there's still 13,000 people who are added to the list per month, so we're never gonna have enough. Uh, and on top of that, 13 people are dying each day waiting for a life-saving transplant. So let's consider this chart here. Um, there's, uh, kidneys are gonna be a little bit different of a wait list because we do have an alternative. So we're gonna, people are gonna be able to live longer in need of a transplant um, without ever actually receiving one. So the demand here is gonna be substantially higher than it is for uh, other organs and other transplants. So Medicare is also gonna be extended in the 70s to anyone of any age who requires either dialysis or a transplant to maintain life. So that's going to include roughly 700,000 people in the United States. Um, and so those 700,000 people living with kidney failure make up about 1% of the U.S. Medicare budget or population, uh, but they account for roughly 7% of the Medicare budget. So it's disproportion we're disproportionately spending more on these people than we are on other people. This, this cost is getting pretty expensive. Um, so Medicare, spend, uh, Medicare spending on kidney failure patients in 2016 was $35 billion. So that's a whole lot. So let's consider, or let's compare the, the cost. Let's compare the cost of a transplant to dialysis. So these were more recent numbers, but uh, you know, they, they tended to vary. Uh, but these seem pretty reasonable numbers. Um, so a transplant costs about $400,000 once, that's for the surgery and then it costs $17,000 in medication each year. Dialysis, on the other hand, costs between $90,000 and $120,000 uh, per patient per year. So that kind of depends on probably where you are and the access and the accessibility to the dialysis machines. Okay, so how should we be comparing these? If we're gonna compare transplants to dialysis, it's like it, they, one's more long-term, one's shorter term. So let's think about the, the life expectancy. So a person on uh, dialysis can live uh, around five to 10 years, though some have lived to 20 to 30 years. People who receive a kidney from a live donor tend to go on to live 15 to 20 years before they're gonna need a new uh, replacement kidney. Uh, and people who receive a kidney from a deceased donor go on to be, live about 10 to 15 years before they need a replacement. So 10 years seems like a good number, a good year life expectancy. People on dialysis live to about 10 years and people who receive donors or kidney donors tend to live uh, longer. Um, on top of that, so the, the transplants uh, have about a half-life of 10 years, which means that about 50% of people who get the transplant uh, will still be functioning at 10 years. So at least half of the people will still be functioning. Um, so that seems like, again, a, a good reason to use 10 years as our marker there. Okay, so if we're comparing them over 10 years, we have the transplant surgery, which is $400,000, and then $17,000 in follow-up medical care afterwards. So that's gonna be 400,000 plus 117,000 is gonna be about 570,000 per patient per year, or I guess over 10 years. Um, and then in contrast, we have the dialysis, which is gonna be, let's you know, call it roughly $100,000. It's between 90 and 120, so let's call it $100,000 per person per year. Over 10 years, that's gonna easily be a million dollars. So. Clearly you can see here that like, it would be half as expensive, almost half as expensive for the transplants. And on top of that, it's gonna be incredibly life enhancing and possibly life extending too for the person who receives the transplant. Okay, so now we need to turn to Peter Singer's argument that he presented in Famine, Affluence, and Morality, uh, his paper from 1972. 
Okay, so here's his argument. The first premise is suffering from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad. The second premise, if it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. So we have our conclusion, we ought to prevent as much suffering as we can without sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance. Okay, so the phrase sacrifice something of comparable moral importance, Singer's going to mean causing anything else comparably bad to happen, or doing something wrong in itself, or failing to prevent some moral good. Uh, something that's going to be comparable in sacrifice to the bad thing that we could have prevented. Okay, so this principle is only going to require that we prevent bad things. Um, and only when we, you know, are able to do so without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance. And again, so this comparable moral importance is supposed to be from a disinterested third-party point of view. Um, so if you want, you can also think about it in terms of a more qualified version of this principle. So Singer's going to give us, um, you know, if it's within our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of moral significance, we ought morally to do it. So this one's not even just comparing the two kinds of moral significance, the bad you can prevent versus the good you're um, sacrificing. This one's saying, like, if you have to sacrifice anything of moral importance, not even just comparable, um, then that is, you know, a reason not to, or to not have to do that bad thing, to prevent that bad thing. So that's the qualified version of the principle. Okay. Uh, whew, water just came over the seawall there. <laughs> um, so... This, he gives us this instance of applying the principle. So this is the, the shallow pond example. Um, so imagine that you're walking past a shallow pond and you see a child drowning. Singer thinks you ought to wade in and save that child. It means you're going to get your clothes muddy, your shoes wet, but these are going to be insignificant while the death of the child is presumably going to be a very bad thing. Like, that makes sense. So since Singer came out with this example, uh, there have been other variations that seem to try and raise the stakes here to make it, you know, seem maybe like you're sacrificing something else. Um, so imagine when, you're, uh, when you see the child drowning, you're already late for a job interview. Um, or imagine you're wearing some brand new shoes and you know that if you go in to save the child, those shoes are just going to be completely ruined. So even though in these circumstances, it's more like you may be sacrificing something else than just your clothes, um, it still seems like you're morally obligated to save the child. Clearly losing out on a job interview or ruining your new shoes are not as morally significant as the child or the child's life. So this principle is going to be deceptive. If you are truly going to try and act upon it, um, then you're probably going to have to fundamentally change your life. You're probably going to have to fundamentally change how you approach everything, even in the qualified form. So this is mainly for two reasons. First, the principle doesn't take into account proximity or distance. Um, and second, the principle does not make a distinction between situations where you're the only person who can help and situations where you're just one in a million who could possibly help. So we're going to go through each of these in turn. Uh, so first, uh, not much can be said about taking distance into account. Um, if you believe in anything about impartiality, universalizability, uh, equality, or you know whatever you want to call it, uh, then you can't discriminate against people just because they're further away. Uh, maybe we used to be able to do this um, because it was impractical uh, to try and help people all the way across the world, but advancements in technology have completely made this practical. So you might not have had the obligation before, but you know you definitely have the obligation now. Um, so the internet has brought us even closer. Ooh, wow, these waves are crazy. Um, so the internet has brought the entire world even closer. Um, if you agree that you should be sacrificing these shoes to save a, another child's life, imagine you're on a website and you see an advertisement for the brand new shoes for $200, or you see an advertisement to donate money to an effective charity that's going to save these children's lives in, uh, you know, uh, famine states. Um, it seems like, you know, in that situation, you know, it's clear how the, everything's being brought closer to you. It's it, donating to these children and saving their lives are as easy as buying new shoes on the internet. So I uh, think back to the shallow pond example, uh, but you know, now imagine the child's drowning five uh, miles away, so there's not really anything you can do. Like you're, you're limited by that distance, but now imagine that you know, all you have to do is like press a button on your smartphone and it's gonna like save the child five miles away. It seems like maybe before you didn't have the moral obligation, but clearly now that you are able to prevent that suffering, um, you've now, you now have that moral obligation. 
Um, so now let's consider the other implication of the principle. The fact that you are you know, just one in a million people in the same situation, um, it might make you feel psychologically okay with not doing anything because you see a bunch of other people not doing anything, but this isn't really gonna have an impact on our um, you know, moral obligation here. Um, so yeah, it's not gonna have an impact on your moral obligation. So imagine, again, think back to that drowning child, the, the child in the shallow pond example. Uh, but now you're not the only person around. Now there's other people around you. You might not feel psychologically guilty about not saving the child, uh, but that's not gonna lessen your moral obligation here. So Singer's gonna go on to argue that, uh, you know, we're required, we're morally obligated to donate to famines in Bengal. Um, and I think this is a really good argument, and I totally encourage you guys to check it out. But as I was mentioning, I'm just trying to take this principle and then construct an argument about our moral obligation to donate our kidneys. Okay, so now I'm gonna take Singer's principle and I'm gonna try and construct my own argument. This is gonna be known as the renal failure argument. All right, so the first premise here, suffering and death from end-stage renal failure are bad. Premise two here, if it's within our power to prevent something bad from happening, without thereby sacrificing anything of moral significance, we ought morally to do it. Conclusion, we ought to prevent as much suffering as we can without sacrificing anything of moral importance. So RF1 seems pretty uncontroversial here, our first premise. I mean, this is even something that Congress could agree on. This is why they expanded Medicare in the first place, to help anyone with end-stage renal failure. This is because it is a bad thing. We all generally agree that it's a bad thing, the suffering and, and pain that is caused. So the second premise here is just Singer's uh, qualified principle. Uh, but as he said, you know, this principle is very deceptive. Um, on its face, it might seem true, but um, you know, if we are actually gonna try and live by this, we're gonna have to like completely change our lives or you know, we're obligated to do and help out more situations than we like initially might've thought. So Singer used this principle to argue that we should donate to famines in Bengal. I'm gonna use this principle to try and argue that we are morally obligated to help those with end-stage renal failure. So this might seem obvious, you know, we should help those out, but how are we obligated to help them out and how much? Um, you know, so obviously we already uh, subsidize their medical care through Medicaid. Uh, but still there's people dying of end-stage renal failure every day. So there's still, you know, pain and suffering that's preventable that's happening. We also volunteer to be organ donors when we get our driver's license. Uh, but again, still this isn't enough. And on top of that, kidneys from a live donor are going to have a greater impact than kidneys from a deceased donor. Um, living kidney donations seem to be the best way to actually prevent the suffering. Compared to, you know, living on dialysis, uh, living kidney donors, uh, living kidney donations are less expensive, and they're also going to greatly improve the patient's quality of life. Okay, so yeah, maybe this is something we can prevent, but as the principle says, we're not obligated to do anything um, if we have to sacrifice anything of moral importance. But what are we really possibly going to sacrifice here? Okay, so first you might think I'm sacrificing my kidney, but are you really making a sacrifice? After all, you know, with one kidney, you can, uh, your other kidney grows in size to so about 50 to 70%, and it's actually able to process more than any one person would need to uh, need in a lifetime. Um, so it's not clear that you're sacrificing your kidney, but um, you know, nonetheless, a transplant is a surgery, and as with all surgeries, with all surgical procedures, there is a risk of dying. So you're not sacrificing your life, but you're risking the possibility of sacrificing your life. But they're actually getting really good at these surgeries. They are 99.993% uh, chance of surviving. That means that seven out of every 100,000 donors dies of a surgical complication. But we already engage in risky behaviors all the time, like you know, driving a car or taking a flight. So you can think about these risks in terms of um, you know, passive versus act active risk. So passive risk is the risk that we are you know, implicitly taking on just by living our every ordinary day lives. This is like driving a car or taking a flight. In contrast, active risk is the risk that we are clearly taking on. This would be like you know, volunteering for a surgery that you don't need. Um, but these risks, uh, they might feel psychologically different, but the risk of death is still gonna be present in both. And since the risk of death is not gonna prevent us from engaging in these other activities, it shouldn't see clearly override our moral obligations in you know, this situation. 
Okay, so there's a low risk of dying during the surgery, but you know, how would it affect your life afterwards? Um, so you might think that your life expectancy would go down with only one kidney, but it actually turns out it's this maybe weird statistical anomaly that people who only have one kidney tend to live uh, longer lives than people with two kidneys. Now, uh, again, maybe it's a weird statistical uh, anomaly that they're living longer lives. I'm not suggesting you should go donate your kidneys so you can try and live longer, but the point is that it's at least not going to reduce your life expectancy significantly. Uh, if anything, it's going to probably leave it about the same. Okay, so these are all the things that I can possibly think of that you might be sacrificing, um, but it's not clear that you're actually sacrificing anything. So maybe you can think of something else, and, and I encourage you guys to try and think of other situations or what else you might be sacrificing. Uh, but whatever it is that you might be sacrificing, it might be offset by the benefits you're going to receive as a donor. So no, 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 it's not legal to sell your organs. Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't think about it like that. Um, and I'm not just talking about all the thank you cards you're going to get or the pats on the back for you know, doing something so nice. But rather I'm talking about the medical care you're going to receive in the screening process to even just determine whether you're an eligible donor. One, uh, I came across one estimate that said the uh, screening cost for donations is about $250,000. Um, that is a whole bunch of medical care that most of us are probably never even going to receive in our entire lives. So it's like, okay, maybe everyone is like morally obligated to just go get, you know, tested to see if they could possibly donate um, just to get as much free medical care as they possibly can, just to make sure their body and organs are running as much as they can. Um, and if this is a reason to donate, then also maybe the, the free follow-up care that you'll get as well is another reason to donate. Um, okay, so this benefit alone might justify everyone at least, you know, going to get checked to see if they're possibly a donor. Um, and if you find out you're eligible and you know that there's a low risk of dying during the surgery and it's unlikely to expect your life expectancy, then it seems as though, you know, we're not sacrificing anything of moral or, you know, moral significance. Um, and so we're obligated to donate our kidney. Okay, so you might agree that we're obligated to donate in our kidney, but you know, who are we obligated to donate in our kidney to, and how are we obligated to donate in our kidneys? Okay, so you might think if I had a friend who you know, needed a kidney and we were a match, I would donate to them, for sure. This is known as a paired donation. You are paired with your friend who needs your kidney. But you, know, you probably don't need anyone or know anyone directly who's in need of a kidney, and even if you do, the, the odds are that you're probably not gonna be a match. Nonetheless, the principle says that we're morally obligated to help in situations where we can. Well, this is still in a situation where you can help. There's other ways you can help. So there are these programs known as uh, kidney donor chains. Um, and the best way to help is actually by being a non-directed donor. So donating a kidney without having a person in mind. So the way these chain donations work is they, they start, uh, they're similar to these paired donations. So think about it, you know, you need a kidney and there's someone else who's willing to give up their kidney, but maybe you're not an actual pair. So someone who's willing but incompatible will donate on your behalf. And so they're not going to donate to you, but they're going to donate to someone else. And they're going to donate into this you know, system and the system's going to say, okay, since you donated, um, your partner, the person you're paired with uh, is going to receive back. So you know, you're not necessarily going to be directly donating, but you're donating to this person and that person's paired up with this person who's not, they're also incompatible matches. And then that person's going to donate to your friend. So even though you're incompatible and they're incompatible, you're compatible with their other person and their other person's compatible with you uh, or your friend. And so you're able to make this swap. Okay. So that's, that's like the simple version. Now it's never going to work that way where there's four people who are, you know, going to be perfect pairs or it's not likely to happen that way. Really, um, the best way that these work is that there's a non-directed donor. So um, I have this slide here, you can see it. So someone is willing to donate to someone else. Their kidney is going to go over here. And then the person they're paired with, that they're incompatible with, is going to donate to this person down here. And then their person they're paired with is going to donate to this person down here. And as you can see on the slide, there's going to be these bridge donors. So these are people who, you know, they're going to be paired with someone else but um, they might take a minute, they might take a while before they're able to actually donate to um, you know, the, the other recipient. <sighs> okay, so uh, the non-directed donor is gonna be the person who's gonna start off this chain. And so um, they could possibly, I think the number was, um, they usually help out at least one person, but they can possibly help out as many as 48 other people get uh, kidneys because it's, it's causing this chain reaction of causing all of these um, pairs to match up and light up. Um, and so yes, you're, you're gonna 
be helping more than just one person with your kidney donation and it's going to be incredibly helpful. But you think, okay, as a non-directed donor, am I really obligated to help complete strangers? But again, remember, the principle says that we're obligated to prevent harm in situations where we can. And it doesn't matter how far away they are, how close they are, or how well we know them, or whether they're a stranger. Like, we're still obligated to prevent harm in this world. So the conclusion of this argument is going to be that we're obligated to be non-directed donors. Okay, so that's going to be the argument. Um, and before you come to class, I want you guys to be reflecting on this. I want you to think, are you going to be convinced of this conclusion? So if you're not convinced of the conclusion, then you're going to have to reject one of the premises. So RF1 or RF2. So RF1 seems pretty uncontroversial, but you know maybe there's ways of rejecting it. RF2 is, again, just this principle that we should help in situations where we can, without sacrificing anything of moral importance. This also seems to be pretty clear, and it seems to be a pretty clear moral obligation that we have. So uh, one way out uh, is maybe of, the, of accepting the conclusion here. One way out might be to try and come up with something else that you're actually morally sacrificing. I couldn't think of any things, but that doesn't mean that you can't think of anything. Um, so what I want you guys to be doing is I want you to uh, think of an objection to this argument, you know, rejecting one of the premises and, and why you would reject one of the premises. Um, but then also I want you to think about how someone might respond to you rejecting one of the premises. All right, so think about it like this. Um, so maybe one of the objections to the premises are that, okay, so if I donate my kidney now in a non-directed way, then later on, I, you know, when a loved one or a close family member needs a kidney, like, I couldn't possibly be a match for them. So in other words, like, you're sacrificing your ability to, you know, care for others in the future or care for those that you care about the most. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, and uh, it's, you know, a good exercise is to try and think about how someone would respond to that. So in response to that, someone might say, okay, yep, uh, non-directed donors, uh, if they or their close relatives are in need of a transplant later on, then because they were a non-directed donor, they or their loved one might be given priority um, on the wait list uh, next time around. So, you know, that's how someone might still defend this moral obligation to, you know, be a non-directed donor. So again, I want you guys to think of an objection to this argument and then a response to your objection to this argument. Um, and these are what we're going to talk about in class. This is what we're going to debate in class. Um, this argument, whether we are morally obligated to be non-directed donors or whether we aren't. Okay, so those are things to think about and I'll see you guys in class.